Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Telescope Talk. My name is Tony Darnell from DeepAstronomy.Space, and it's been a while since we've been uh, doing these Hangouts. It's, gosh, I guess the last one was, oh, man, that was a long time ago. I can't remember the last one we had now. But Telescope Talk has been undergoing a little bit of a high, uh, not a high, well, we would have been on hiatus, but we've also been kind of going through a little bit of a retooling. Uh, and so I thought I would let you know uh, some of the things that are going to be changing. First of all, we're broadcasting on YouTube as well as Twitch and Periscope. I'm not doing Facebook because they it costs extra money, and I don't have that right now. Uh, but we are Telescope Talk is going to be on Tuesday nights at our new this is our new time Tuesdays at three o'clock Eastern time, and we are going to alternate. There's going to be an amateur version, and there's going to be a pro version. The amateur version you're watching today. This is where we promote a, the hobby of amateur astronomy. We talk with amateur astronomers. We give you advice on equipment and, and 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 observing techniques and imaging techniques and uh, we will sometimes have guests we sometimes won't we'll just talk and just give you our experience because we've got a lot of it here in telescope talk and then every on the alternate Tuesdays we're going to have the pro version where we look at ground-based astronomical uh, discoveries and equipment from the professional side because one of the things that I feel like we've lacked with between Future and Space and, and Astro Coffee is we don't have a really good look at what goes on on the ground in the professional realm. And so that's what that tell that that is what that uh, hangout will do. In fact, next Tuesday we have lined up somebody from the Square Kilometer Array where we will be talking about what it's going to be doing. And we also have someone from the uh, the solar, the DKIST solar telescope that's being built on Maui right now. So we've got a lot of things planned, a lot of things been going on. We hope you like this. Today uh, we are going to be talking with an amateur astronomer named Tom Pickett who has been around for a long time, very knowledgeable uh, amateur astronomer who has is going to share his insights <coughs> with us today. But let me go ahead and bring up everybody here. So here is our panel today. Um, we have a new guy, Adam Synergy Smith. Usually is with us, but he, for some, he couldn't make it today. Uh, but we also have uh, right below me is Peter Quinn. He has got him from the. He's a Newcastle Geordie from the UK. Hi, hi, hey, how you doing, hey. Peter? It's good to have you on our Hello. on our panel. And nice right, to be here. and right next to him is uh, John Suffle, also from the UK. Uh, have a big UT UK contingent on this program because a lot of people uh i guess it's big, i don't know john what do you think is it because it's in the evening that a lot of a lot of uk people tend to be watching this hangout because of the time slot or i mean it just seems like we have a, uh, yeah, I, I think basically the board the board <laughs> well we we it's hope they're we students. hope they're too we hope they're tuning in for our amazing personalities too but who knows um, I also want to let you guys know that I am going to be posting the audio of all of our Hangouts now uh, on uh, anchor.fm slash deep astronomy. That is where this podcast, it will go out in the form of a podcast, which will be syndicated on all the little places where you get uh, podcasts. And uh, that's turned out to be pretty good uh, results so far with a lot of the other Hangouts that I do. So that'll be just the audio portion. Unfortunately, if you're listening to this, uh, you won't see a lot of the pictures that we're going to be showing. But uh, it's it's good if you're in the car driving or whatever, because a lot of the <coughs> stuff that we're going to be talking about is, uh, is just fine to be consumed over audio. And of course, as always, we're live and we hope you will interact with us. And uh, the best way to do that is on our Discord server, which the link to that is in the description box. And we also have the uh, live chat going on here. So, and James Dugan's there, and I even see John and Peter interacting there. So, good guys, thanks for doing that. So, leave your questions there and on Discord, and I'll also be checking Twitch, but nobody seems to be watching on that yet. So, we are we're there a bit, but I don't think we're going to get a lot of interaction. But we'll see if hopefully we we might. Okay, let me introduce my guest. His name is uh, Tom Pickett, and I got his name from one of the, our one of our Discord uh, members, uh, Uncle Bill, who told me about Tom. And Tom, you. You uh, have been around the amateur astronomer hobby for quite a bit, haven't you? Yes, I have. Why don't I you actually, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into amateur astronomy? Oh, my God. It goes way back to when I was about seven years old. Uh, my dad was driving down the road, and it was probably about 11 o'clock at night. And I, I had the window rolled down, and I was looking up at this pattern in the, in the sky, I told my dad, I says, you know what, dad, that looks like a giant spoon in the sky over there. And he says, son, he kind of chuckled a little bit, you know, and 
you know, kind of told me that that was the big difference. And from that night forward, I was just like memorized. I mean, it, it just like took a hold of you, and, you know, and and just shook you and just let you know there's a lot out there, you know. And I told myself I was going to learn a lot more about that Big Dipper. You know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, over the year, back when I was about, oh, I would say I was eight or nine, or nine years old, I went to a friend's house, and I was always real handy with fixing things. I was one of those kids, you know, that just knew how to fix things. And my friend's mother was having a problem out of her out of her clothes dryer and we went over there and pulled the dryer out from the wall and there was this white tube sitting up against the wall you know there and i said and i asked my buddy what is that he said i think that's a telescope huh and <laughs> what it was it was a it was the tube of a toa night it's about 19 late late 1960s 4.5 inch reflector just leaning up against the wall there. And I told him, I says, uh, how much you want for that thing? Do you want to sell it? And he says, oh, we'll sell it for about 20 bucks. So I went home and started mowing grass around the neighborhood, trying to, you know, trying to make money and stuff, you know, so I could save it for the telescope. I went over there uh, after about a week of mowing grass. And I went over there and got that tube and we went into the garage and the rest of the tripod and everything was in, was in the garage. And I took this thing home and took it all apart. It had dryer lint. It was full of dryer lint because it had been back there for so many years behind the dryer. And actually the dryer lint saved the mirror, kept the mirror from getting damaged. <laughs> so I took and cleaned it all up and I was smart enough to understand that those mirrors had to be aligned a certain way to get it to come out the side of that tube. So uh, without any knowledge of knowing how to line one of those up, I just started messing with the screws and making sure, looking down the tube and looking in the focuser. And, now this was a, a Newtonian, you know, right? Yes, this was a matter of fact. I got the I got the telescope right here. I knew it. I knew it. Everybody <laughs> always keeps everybody keeps their first telescope. They always do. Yes. Everybody <laughs> always oh, keeps their first. Cool. I, yeah, I knew he'd have it sitting around. Well, it's funny because a lot of us have stories like that where we first, you know, the very we can always remember the very first time we really wondered and wanted to get involved in amateur astronomy. For yeah. me. For me, it wasn't until high school because I was more enamored with the Apollo space program. But but uh, when I finally got into amateur astronomy, it was in high school. And the first time I, I used a telescope was, was then as well. It was a Criterion RV6, 6-inch Newtonian telescope. So uh, that's what I used. John, what about you? When was the, what was the first telescope you used? I'm waiting for Tom to go get it. He, he just left <laughs> to go get the scope. So. <laughs> I'm just trying to put it together where you guys can see it. So, okay, uh, that's cool. That's cool. Then go right ahead. John, what about you? Your first time with a telescope? Uh, that was um, when I was about, oh, let's see, about eight or nine, seven, eight or nine, with a poxy little um, telescope from um, Tasco. A Tasco? Um, yeah, I wouldn't recommend anybody buying no, it. No, no, that's not a good first brand. But it's a lot of brands people use for the first time, for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but one of the first um, stars that I looked at at my bedroom uh, window just happened to be Saturn. Oh, and, good. Um, it's hard to mess up Saturn. Saturn. Oh. Peter, how about you? Do you have a first, do you have a first telescope story? Uh, no, but my grandfather always had a pair of binoculars. So when we weren't checking the planes coming in uh, Newcastle Airport, <laughs> we used to, you know, in the evenings when it got dark, just used to look up and see what we could see. Yeah. And it was, well, we could see the moon really clearly with a pair of binoculars, no problem at all. Uh. See um, the lakes all the main features binoculars are a great way to get started they really are that's cool okay tom you're back binoculars are actually the best way that i would tell anybody to start amateur astronomy before they even go down and buy a telescope the first thing i would tell somebody is to learn the sky with a pair of binoculars 
And once you see the objects in there, you will determine on what objects that you want to go after. Because every telescope is a little bit different with a different field of view. But anyway, let me turn my camera over here. And there is the telescope I'm talking about. You said it's a four and a half inch? It's a four and a half inch TOA reflector. And everybody on the planet copied that thing. Will you spell Tadpole. spell the name again? I don't I never heard of that. What's it called? T W O A. T W O A. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, I've never heard of that brand. Okay. And everybody copied that thing. I mean Now you copied. you got that you got that tube for twenty bucks. Did you have to buy that mount later? I, the mount and the tripod was in, was in my friend's garage. We went there and got it out of his garage. It was laying down in, a, with some, you know, with some old boxes and stuff. And because uh, I asked him where we, you know, where the rest of it was, because I wasn't just going to buy the tube for twenty bucks. I wanted the whole, you know, yeah. the whole telescope. But, oh, okay. So you did. So he had the whole assembly. But I went home and put that thing together and cleaned it all up. And my buddy came over and we said, what are we going to look at first? And uh, we had a little cheap eyepiece and we were looking at this bright star. The star was really, really bright. And we, he, he said, why don't you point it at that bright star? And we pointed it straight up because it was almost straight overhead. And sure enough, we looked at it and, and I went, that's not a star. And I started looking at it and I started remembering some of the planets that I would see in these, in our science books and classes. I said, that's got to be Jupiter. Sure enough, it was Jupiter. <laughs> so uh, the first object that I seen through that scope was Jupiter. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, give us an idea. Give, give us an idea. This is for the, the you beginners out there who are always asking, what can I see with a telescope for the first time? And Tom was just talking about he's got a four and a half inch reflector that he got from a friend in the basement. When you looked, Tom, through that telescope at Jupiter, what did you see and what magnification were you using? I believe I was using a magnific uh, 22 millimeter counter eyepiece. It was a real cheap <clears throat> eyepiece, but you could see the planet. You could see the, the moons of the planet. At the time, I thought that they were just four stars. That was next to the planet. You're talking about the Galilean know, moons. The four. Yeah, I actually did not know I was looking at the Galilean moons. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, after some time and after knowing where that where that planet came up every, every night, I just started doing a little bit of studying on it and found out that I was looking at the moons too. And I, I was kind of overwhelmed because I was surprised that you could see it that good with a little small telescope, you know. And... Uh, after that, I went down to some shops and got some better eyepieces. I got some some uh, Celestron eyepieces that were inch and a quarter, but I had to put an adapter on it because they were all .96 back then. Ah, oh, right. And, and I had to screw this one and a quarter inch adapter on the back of the, you know, Plazo eyepiece. And once I put that Plazo eyepiece, man, the view just all oh, instantly was better than what came with the actual telescope. And you so, find that a lot. I mean, sometimes these eyepieces are yeah. worth more than the telescope, but they're they're yes. a good they're a good investment. Uh, and what yeah. he's talking about also with the sizes, 0.965 means the diameter in inches yeah. of the tube that goes into the focuser. And there's right. a, there's two main sizes. Well, there's three main. There's actually three. There's 0.965, which I don't even think they make anymore. Then there's inch and a quarter, and then there's two-inch eyepieces. So the two-inch eyepieces are really big, usually very expensive, quite heavy. Um, okay, Tom, well, I want to get to some of your – uh, imaging uh, advice and some so show some of your examples. But, but before I do, with every guest I have, especially one as experienced as you, we want to appeal to people who've never been into amateur astronomy before. Someone who thinks they might be interested in the hobby, but they don't know for sure, and they're thinking about buying a telescope, but they don't really know what to get. What is your advice for somebody who's never owned a telescope before and they want to go buy one? What would you tell them? Like I said earlier, uh, probably a good set of 10 by 50 binoculars. Actually study the sky, learn the constellations, learn where everything is. Because if you buy a telescope, if you don't know where to point the thing, because it's a very narrow field of view, you're, you're going to get frustrated. 
And usually what happens when a newcomer comes into the hobby and they get frustrated and they can't find anything with the telescope, the telescope goes in the closet and it stays there. It doesn't come back out. Yeah. So uh, usually what I say is to buy a nice pair of 10 by 50 binoculars, start scanning the sky, get you one of those star charts where you can look at the const, learn the constellations, learn where everything is. Once you start learning where everything is, you know where to point this telescope at. You well, exactly. okay, Tom, but you know what's going to happen. Someone's going to say, oh, I'll just buy one of those go-to telescopes. Where all I got to do is turn it on. It's going to determine where it is, and then it's going to find everything for me. What do you say to that? Well, you got to the, the go-to telescope. You got to know where a few objects are to even line the thing up. Not anymore. No, you could just turn them on. They, <laughs> they use the GPS to, to, to decide where they well, are on I've the planet. Used, I, I don't use those, so I'm not... <laughs> you're hardcore I'm, okay. I, I do it the hardcore way and I know where the stuff is and I just got a uh, I, I just got a tail rad you know that I use and I don't know if you guys know what a tail rad oh yeah is, yeah those are the little I, heads up I, device I've been using one of those for years and I know where everything is so I don't need a I don't need a, a okay well, well getting getting back to your binocular comment you said 10 by 50s why don't you tell us what the numbers mean when you say ten by fifty, what do you what does that mean? The fifty is the size of the front of the lenses on on the uh, on the binoculars, and the ten is how much you're multiplying the image by. And then sometimes you have like a ten, uh, maybe a five millimeter exit pupil, you know, coming out the back end. So I don't know why they don't go five, ten, fifty, you know, because you need to know what the exit pupil is on the back of the yeah, that's true, and, and the exit pupil is an important consideration because that yeah. is how big the image would be on your retina, and that's yeah. something that you need uh, to. It's an, because if it's too small, uh, then you are you're at probably at too high a magnification. If it's too large, you're missing your you're getting vignetting exactly. and and things like that from your own eyes. Exactly. So. Okay, well, all right, a pair of binoculars, I think we all agree on that. Everybody everybody thinks a pair of binoculars is always a good place to start. Absolutely learning the night sky is critical, whether or not you decide to buy a go-to telescope. Now, if you don't know what a go-to telescope is, that's these computerized jobs that you can buy. They're getting to be under 100 bucks now. Uh, where Ooh, you can get them that cheap now. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, some of them, yeah. Really? Um, and you just basically plug them in. They have onboard GPSs so they can determine where on the planet they are as well as what time it is. And then they can just align themselves to the sky all by, without you doing a single thing, which but hardcore has, amateurs like Tom, me, and Peter, and everybody, else, we're going to frown on that because it doesn't give you a skill set that, that you don't connect with your telescope. That's exactly, and you're not connecting with the sky either. I mean, exactly. in, in a big way. I mean, if you learn what these objects are, and you know, there's something that gets inside your head. You, the knowledge starts coming inside your head. But with the something you're pushing the buttons on, you know, it's just you'll wake up the next morning not not understanding where that object was. It was just a telescope pointing. To yeah, you just and go ahead, Peter. If, if if you don't know where the object roughly is in the sky is, that automated telescope might connect with you, your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a good way of looking at it. you don't know where it's going. <laughs> okay, well, the... the um... I just want to let you guys know on Twitch, I'm seeing you there. Thanks, Uncle Bill and Tal Deuce and uh, NatFan for being there. I'm watching your chat, so that's really great. And I'm also checking out the live stream, and I'm going to read out some questions here in a little bit. All right, Tom, so you've given us your advice on for beginners, what you think they should be getting. Uh, I agree with you. And um, I, I, another piece of advice I always get is don't spend too much. Now, if, <coughs> if, if, if you don't know if you're going to be into this hobby – then don't spend more than five hundred dollars. I always say that. Just don't, don't, because if you spend fifteen hundred, two thousand on a nice uh, eight-inch Schmidt Cassegrain Mead or Celestron or whatever it happens to be, and then you, you, you know, you, you don't feel like lugging that seventy-pound telescope outside, then you're going to have, uh, you, then basically you, the telescope's just going to sit in your closet, or you're going to end up putting it on Craigslist. And, and well, and, a good telescope for starters, after you, after you get past the binocular stage, I would say a good Newtonian. If they're real cheap, 
They got a lot of bang for their buck. You and like Dobsonians? I mean, we yeah. argue here. Well, but... I, I'm at the stage where I wouldn't buy one if, if I was at my stage right now. But for a beginner, that would be the first telescope that I would advise you to buy. <laughs> there, you can see a lot of objects with them, and they're big. They got a big aperture on them. And if you know where the optics are after you've scanned the sky with a pair of binoculars, you'll be able to find, and you'll be pleased with the image in those. Yeah. You know, so. Uh, because yeah. the you can generally buy a larger diameter telescope for the money, right. uh, and that gives you yeah. brighter images. You can collect more photons and things like that, and you can yes. also save your money and, and buy use the money you saved on a Dobsonian for buying more eyepieces. Um, so real quick, give, it, tell it, give us an idea of what kind of eyepieces you think everybody should have as a beginner, and what, oh. what style. I got, well, <laughs> nobody can go out and afford one of these okay that's not hold on hold it up yeah let me make you big yeah that's not that's a nagler those are my favorite i love those those are amazing look at the size that hold it up again tom look at the size of this this is an eyepiece folks that is something that you look through your telescope with look at the piece of glass in there that is what is it 22 millimeters is that what it is it's wide field millimeter, uh, it's a 22 millimeter nagler for it to me this is Probably the best eyepiece that that's Telview ever made. I mean, it's got a nice 82 degree field of view in it, and it's just it's just an overall good eyepiece for just about anything you want to view. So uh, it's got good eye relief. It's like watching TV looking through that eyepiece. It's like looking through a porthole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how much was that thing? How, how how much, Tom? How much was it? How much is this? Yeah. Uh, I think I paid a little over 400 bucks when it was new, but I think you can pick them up now on eBay for about 275 Yeah, so that's what I mean about you could easily spend more uh, than you uh, yeah. spend on your telescope for, for one of those yeah. things. Yeah, so good. Yes. Yeah, so, but, but, but that's okay, but my question was... Beginner, beginner's not going to go out and buy that. So, no. so what would you, what, what, what should? There's always tele, eyepieces that come with your telescope. Usually, if you buy one from. Puzzles are pretty good. Usually, the usually the the eyepieces that will come with the telescope are basically decent enough where you can use them. And if you want to go upgrade, Mead and Celestron make some pretty good eyepieces. You know, on on, on the cheap side and. Uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, scientific. They sell eyepieces. You know that's within a budget range. Is Edmund? Uh, is Edmund still around? Edmund Scientific. Yeah, I don't. I'm not really sure. I actually bought after I upgraded from my 4.5 inches a year. I actually bought my first new telescope at Edmund Scientific there in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, uh, they're in Philadelphia. Are they? And, uh, okay. They used to be in New and, Jersey. Uh, they, they're they the ones that sold the AstroScan yeah. 2001 back in the day. And they used to have a lot of other telescopes that they... Uh, they were one of the only ones that sold fork-mounted equatorials, which uh, are fork-mounted Newtonians, I mean, which I really liked. Yeah. I thought those looked really cool. Um, anyway. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So, uh, beginners, get into the hobby slowly. Don't spend a lot of money. And uh, absolutely go to, I mean, this is something John says all the time, go to your, go to your uh, uh, astronomy clubs and get involved. They will let you look through all manner of telescopes for absolutely nothing. And you Well, can... you just hit the nail on the head right there. If you want to really start buying a telescope, get involved in your local astronomy club that's in the area and go look through some telescopes. Yep. You know, if there's a uh, if there is a a club around, they usually have like a maybe a twenty five dollar membership fee, and that's for like a year. And you can go to these star parties. You can get to learn a lot of the telescopes and a lot of the eyepieces on things that you want to buy, things that you want to that you will use, actually use. And uh, that's another bit of good advice that I could tell anyone. Uh, just just look it up in your phone book. See if they See if there's a somewhere around in your neighborhood that's you know that's got a club going uh, that's in astronomy and almost yeah, everybody I does. I mean, yes, yeah, yes. Every, uh, there's one uh, that's pretty close to almost everyone. Even Newcastle has one, don't they, Peter? 
Yeah, there's Sunderland and there's Northumberland. And if they if the Northeast has an astronomy club, every anybody does. The weather <laughs> yeah. there is not the most conducive. Uh, that's the thing about the British. Tyneside isn't really the place for <laughs> no, especially not in the winter. <laughs> Apart from the coast, yeah. And uh, yeah. how are things well, by so by where you are, John? Northumberland come come down here to Northumberland Park in North Shields. So uh, you know, it's... you do. I'll tell you the one. The only time I ever saw the ISS was in England. For for some reason, it seems to always pass over the UK more regularly than it does where I live here in Florida. So yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. at least I've seen it at the star party that I went to, and I've seen it uh, since and before then. <laughs> and John, how are things out by you? Do you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of active clubs too? Don't you? Yes, there's um, four in the whole area. Um. Um, I th in theory, belong to um, three of them, um, but um, like you're saying, with uh, you know, going on to an astronomy club, if they ever want to um, sell any of their equipment, <coughs> then, um, they know that you are looking for something. They'll come to you. That's there. You go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I like that. Great advice. Into my telescopes, um, uh, Max Maxitov Cassegrain. And um, a Celestron D seventy. I paid twenty five pounds each for them. <laughs> yeah, that's a good. That's good advice. Yeah, the Cassegrain at the time, brand new, would have cost um, two hundred and twenty five. It costs more now. Most amateur. You're going to find this, folks. Most amateur astronomers have a house full of telescopes and they want to get another one but before they do their wife will say you've already got a lot of telescopes you need to get rid of some of these that you have and then they go to the amateur astronomy club and they say I got a telescope for sale anybody want to buy this and you get a good deal because a lot of times they also in addition to wanting to help you get started they also want to usually get another telescope and it helps give them an excuse to do that okay John Schnupp on YouTube good, good, <laughs> good question good segue any advice this is for Tony or Tom or anybody. Uh, any advice for beginning astrophotographers? Almost always look through a scope and then want to take a picture of what they see. Tom, this is your thing, right? This is what you do. Uh, yeah. You are a you are an imager. You've made your name. You share your images with thousands of people. So tell us about first of all how you got into imaging, and then advice for beginners. And then we're going to show some of your images. I'm going to go back. Uh, probably about 10 years, I started astrophotography doing it the old fashioned way with hybrid film and stuff like that. And to tell you the truth, I'm, I would never go back to it. But <laughs> what, one thing, one thing, one thing that hybrid film did for you though, it taught you patience. It taught you that you only had like 24 shots and this film was very expensive. And you try to do everything you could to get the best shot that you could. Let, let me just interrupt you for let me just interrupt you for a quick moment, Tom. What he's talking about is hypered uh, twenty four fifteen technical pan film that Kodak came out with. It was a black and white right. film, and if you exposed it to hydrogen gas, which is what was called hypersensitizing it, that increased the ISO of that film from something that was like I don't know right. two or three hundred or something like that to well over 1600 uh iso that's the <laughs> speed of the film that is the amount of light that can be collected per unit time and in astrophotography when you're photographing very dim things you want as fast a film as possible but if you just went out to the store and bought 400 kodak ektachrome 4 400 or whatever it was then you, you also got a lot the grain size got really Big, I think it was. I forget the relation. Yeah. Fast film equals big grain size, whatever it was. Anyway, you got lower Fast resolution, film. and so Fast what he film equals big grain, yeah. Yeah. So what he was talking about is hypering twenty four fifteen film was something people did. I did it. I did it back in the day. Uh, I didn't enjoy you it either. Kept it frozen after you did it, and to make sure that when you got it out there, everything was going to go, you know, just perfect. But anyway. uh I was thinking about getting into digital photography, but I waited for quite a while until the cameras got a lot better and the noise levels got a lot better and the chip size got a lot better. So the first thing that I used, I started back in 2011. And I wow, that's not so long ago. I started with this 
T3I here, you know, that I got. Mm -hmm. And at first, I just put it on a little mini mount, you know, a, a little bitty tracking mount that had a clock drive on it and, and a nice uh, surveyor's tripod where the wind went blowing it around. And I just started pointing it at some objects, you know, uh, where I, I knew the objects were. And at first, I didn't get very good images with this. I mean, they wasn't good and they wasn't bad either. But what I did is I just kept using it, kept learning, kept learning the camera, kept learning where, uh, basically, I learned where the sweet spot on the camera was, where the image would be at its best. And I, I started to understand that if you, if you were looking at the histogram, that the camera provides you, and if you put the curve in the center of the histogram, that you would always end up with, you would always end up with a really good image. Now, if you were just to the left of the histogram of the center of the histogram, you would end up with uh, tell us what a histogram a is. Banding noise. Yes, you would end up with a lot of banding noise, you, and the banding noise is caused by the wells on the CMOS not being full. And what you're actually seeing is you're seeing the pixel grid. The pixel grid gets exposed onto, you know, the image. And what happens is when you shoot it, when you get the light curve right in the center, that's where the perfect exposure is. Now, if you go a little bit to the right, it's okay. But if you start going too far to the right of the histogram, you know, with the light curve, your stars start getting overexposed. Okay, you need to tell us what a histogram is, though, Tom. I don't think a lot of people know what a histogram is. Histogram is shows the basic red, green, and blue colors of where the peaks are on the actual image, on the digital image. Yeah. Uh, yes, you would have to look, and uh, uh, Photoshop even has a histogram on it that will show you, the, you know what it is, it's a curve that comes up and then goes back down. And that curve will show you one, and it, depending on how long your exposure is that curve will move either to the left or to the right yep. okay. the brighter of uh, that the exposure is the more it will move to the right the less time uh, that you have exposed the more it's going to be to the left so and i usually try to put the light curve right in the center or a little bit a little bit right of center and to do that right. you have to play with both your aperture and your exposure times exactly. right okay yes yes so yes. Okay, so yes. all right, so you started out with just a normal DSLR. Now you didn't you didn't buy one of the uh, no. dedicated astronomical CCD cameras that you can buy because well, why not? I didn't have twelve thousand dollars. <laughs> I didn't have twelve thousand dollars. That'll you know? do it. <laughs> yeah, by comparison, so, you could get a five hundred dollar ish DSLR that'll do pretty darn good. What are the qualities? of a DSLR that amateur astronomers need to, to look for? When you go to buy a camera well, that you're going to attach to your telescope, what are you looking for? What are the important... One thing that I like about this camera here in particular, it's got a pretty good size chip on it. It's about, it's about 22 millimeters by 14 millimeters. And it's a, you know, it, it, it's actually a, a, a ASKC you know, sensor, and it's about half the size of a full frame, basically. And uh, one thing that I like about the ASP, uh, these type of cameras is because uh, you can get away from the VEC netting that's caused with a full frame. You'll end up with a, this dark area around your image with this bright spot right in the middle. And these chips seem to be small enough where the chip size will actually fit right inside that halo to where you don't have so much bed netting, uh, you know, with the bad camera lens or, right. you know, bad telescopes. That's right. So, uh, and that's that's actually a problem nowadays that didn't used to exist back in the day of 35 millimeter film because 35 millimeter no. film was 35 millimeters and it had a, a yeah. set of size where yeah. you could fill the frame with whatever it is you were looking at with a telecompressor or whatever. Yes. But here, uh, the the CCDs are actually getting large enough where it's an issue. Now, is that a CMOS detector or a CCD? It's a CMOS. Okay, and they tend to have higher noise, but um, they have, and they they don't always work as well. They have high dark current, um, things like that usually. But 
another quality that I want to point out is that you also need to have, it needs to be able to remove the lens. Like if you bought those, I think right. the Rebel cameras, for example, I can't remember, but some of them, you can't take the lens off. And yeah. you really need to be able to do that for amateur astronomy. You've got to take the be you got to take be able to take the lens off and put adapters yes. on so you can you can attach it to your to your telescope. Uh, so is that your main imager? I have been using this ever since 2011, and I just upgraded now to a mono CMOS, which I just got the other day, and I'm just now moving up from this right here, but. There's a lot of things that I learned that you can do with one of these cameras that a lot of people don't know. I mean, you can, uh, if you look at some of my images I have on there, I can get just about professional quality images with just with this little camera. And usually during uh, during the winter night, you know, the coldest nights, this camera really performs because the camera itself gets cold, you know, and uh, when it gets cold outside, this thing performs like. I mean, like, really unbelievable. So uh, okay. I think one of these cameras here has got like a 40 to 45 percent, you know, QE on it, which is almost close to what you would get with one of these. Quantum, that's efficiency. quantum efficiency. Yeah. That's how yeah. that's how yeah. well the detector yeah. turns a photon into an electrical signal. Exactly. All right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So I have a picture up, Tom, of I what I think is your... I don't know if it's your old unit or your your new unit, and we should probably tell that story too. But what this image that you sent me, it looks like a, a really nice refractor sitting on a tripod yeah. with a really nice beefy mount. Do you want to describe it for us? Yeah, that is a Takahashi EM200 that I bought on cloudy nights. I think I paid, uh, I think I paid like four thousand for that mount. And uh, for the mount. Yes, yes, just for the mount itself. That was, and that mount was eight years old when I paid that much money for it. But, but one thing about the mount is, if you buy that mount brand new, the head, just the head's going to cost you fifty two hundred without the tripod, without all the accessories with. So by the time, if you're going to buy one of those brand new, by the time you you get it all all set up with all the bells and whistles on it, you're looking anywhere between seven to eight thousand dollars. So, uh, so that, and then I, after I bought the mount, I turned around and uh, William Gang contacted me one day, and he sent me an FLT one thirty two for me to use, and I started using that. So, what's an I FLT? What is that? Was that a refractor reflector? That, that's a that, that, that's a hundred and thirty two millimeter refractor. I think it's a uh, nine hundred twenty five millimeters focal length. That's the length of the cone, uh, you know, the light cone. Right. And what's the field of view on one of these scopes? Uh, I, They're pretty wide field for a, for a refractor, aren't they? What's the F yeah, ratio? You can, you can fit, you can fit the entire, uh, Orion Nebula along with the running man in one single frame using, using this camera with it. So, and, and I've, I've actually got some images. Along with the Running Man, what's that? The Running Man is another nebula that's right beside the Orion Nebula. Oh, I've never it's called that it that. You've never heard it called that before. <laughs> hey, hey. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so that's pretty well. So, that, and that's, this is why they're expensive, folks. A, a large aperture refractor, one that's big enough to be able to collect a lot of light uh is going to be in and have a wide field of view is going to be very expensive because the glass has to be completely perfect and they all have to be ground is this say uh, an apocrymat or what kind of refractor is it it's an it's a apocrymat okay it's an apo yes okay. and the it's an, it's an apo triplets what it is okay and that and just and then and then i got a fill a fill flattener at the other end of it you know, you know, it flattens the field, so you get a good flat image. Okay. Uh, and, yeah, so uh, the, that just refers to how many elements are in the, the lens, and, and it's also got yeah. some very high, probably some high transmission coatings in it that per, let as much light go through as I possible. I think they call it LFP53 or something like that. It's, it's like an ED glass that they put in those. Okay. 
does. And yeah, so these are generally not for beginners. This will be something that's for a, an amateur. And you noticed, I mean, an advanced amateur. And you noticed that he talked about the expense of that mount. We've talked about that so many times here on Telescope Talk. You have got to have a sturdy mount, and it's got to work well. It's got to yeah. track very, very accurately, or you're going to get crap images. All right, let's let's sh let's show some of your images. All right, I've got this one. Well, basically, uh, let me carry on for what you just said. Oh, there. all Ashley, right. Actually, <coughs> the mount. <coughs> That's something down my throat here. Oh, okay. Well, I, I tell you what. I'll, let me just finish. I'll finish my thought, and then you can go. You can jump in when you're ready. So. The mount, when you're doing imaging, is, I would argue, more important than the optical train because the yeah. while you do need good optics, almost everything can be processed in a way that if you've got mediocre optics, okay, you can always compensate for that. But if your enjoyment of imaging is going to be directly proportional to how good that mount is, how sturdy how it is. How good that mount is because if, you, if that mount is, is not tracking well and it's not sturdy enough, and you got a little bit of wind blowing, you know, like a little light breeze. You want to be able, you want that mount to be able to hold up to all that, and you want it to be able to uh, to take the to take the stress and the weight of the telescope that's on it to be able to do it. So, uh, okay, well, um, that's very important. That the mount is the heart of the whole operation. Yeah, and Uncle Bill is commenting on Twitch. He's saying, I was very impressed that Tom bought and used the mount for almost a year before getting the scope and produced great images. So, yeah, yeah it's very important. He's also, uh, he, Uncle Bill's also commenting, Tom also has one of these cannons that has been modified for astrophotography with a chiller and other stuff. Is that true? Yes, yes. The, uh, the camera that I just showed you is actually a modified camera. And let me kind of open, let me take the lens off of it. And it's actually got or has a UV IR cut filter. If you can see it right there. Yeah. Right there. Oh, yeah. And that right there blocks all the uh, infrared, you know, wavelengths and, you know, the UV light where you get a really nice image without all of the uh, hassle. How do you cool it? How do you cool I it? I don't cool it. Oh, okay. All right. So Uncle Bill said you yeah. had some kind of a chiller or something on there. But I think you just said when you use it in a cold night, it works a lot better than when it doesn't. Okay. Um, yeah. I want to show a couple of your images. Maybe you can talk about these. I've got I, – I did – you said – when I it was funny. I asked Tom uh, – I asked Tom to send me some images so we could talk about astro imaging, and he sent me a folder full uh, of images. I've got about so oh, I don't know eight or nine of them here, uh, but the uh, the first one that I want to show you is one of the of the moon that you took. Uh, I think it's at four power. Is that right? Can you talk about that image a little bit? How you Let took it? Let me go over here where I've got it on Facebook, and I've got all the description in there. Ah, okay. Let me let me point people to your Facebook page. Facebook.com slash. Well, wait a minute. The it's the link is in the description box. So just click on it there, folks. I I, I remember. I and what Facebook. I can do is I can scroll down here, and I I usually put all the details in there because. I'm never going to remember all of this stuff by heart. Well, that's okay. I mean, just just broad strokes here. But the, the the moon, the full moon, is a very difficult thing to image anyway. It's also very painful to look at through a telescope on a dark night because you end up ruining your okay, night vision. Right mm. This image that you're looking at, uh, let me pull it down here. Uh, I'm waiting for it here. This image here has... I, I got a stack of 200 images each and that one image. What I did was is I went out and took uh, 200 images and they were 1, one to 1 16th thousandths of, an, of a second. And uh, what I did is I took uh, 200 of those and I took them and put them in Photoshop and aligned each one of the images separately, all 200 of them. Just moved them over, moved them up and down. And then after I got them aligned. By hand? I, I, I aligned them in Photoshop by hand. <laughs> moved, them, moved them up and down and over. 
And then once I got them all aligned, I took and cropped it. I took and cropped it all the way around the boundary of the moon. And once I got it cropped, then I went in there and saved each individual image over into a folder. And, and the reason why that I did that, once I got it saved, then because they were all cropped in the same position, I was able to go over into uh, Deep Sky Stacker, turn off the alignment tool in Deep Sky Stacker, and Deep Sky Stacker, Deep Sky Stacker actually stacked all 200 of those images just from the outer boundary of the crop and put the in. So basically, I stat, was able to stack 200 images in Deep Sky Stacker. And what uh, were what was the exposure time of each? Do you know? Do you remember what the exposure time one was? One slash uh, sixteen hundred. Okay, so a 16, one sixteen hundredth of a second. Yeah, and let me go over here again. It, I, I've got the ISO that I had it on. I didn't mention that. The ISO is the in a digital camera. It tries to mimic what it would have been on film, which we talked about earlier. Uh, but it's a speed of yes. Yes, correct. And I used ISO 100, the lowest setting on my camera that had the lowest noise. Okay, good. All right, well, that's and beautiful. I shot, I shot that with the with the William Optics FLT 132. That's amazing. Okay, let's talk. I'm, I'm and, gonna... and there's another image in there of the same, of this one that I have cropped where it brings it in closer. That's the one I think I've got up. I've got the closer one up okay. the, the one that's cropped um sorry i should have specified that um but yeah one one thing i notice is there's color in here and when you look at the moon you generally don't see it's just basically one big gray disc but here you've got like little splashes of yellow and maybe some orange in there uh were these filtered or did you just is that just a result of the rgb channels that was just with a standard not with a standard uh, T3i that's not even modified. It was just taken with a standard camera. Right. How important okay. is, how hard is it for you to focus these images, Tom? What I do is I turn on the live view on the camera and I turn on the 10x zoom on the camera and bring the star or the object in, in real close and then I focus it using using the live view on the camera. Okay. Is that how, but that's not how you, so let me move from this moon image, this lunar image, which is gorgeous, to another one that you took of Comet Lovejoy. Now this oh, image. Oh man, I, I absolutely love that image. That was one of those images where I was in what I would call my amateur days of learning my camera. And that night I got lucky with the settings on that camera. And that image just went crazy. <laughs> I mean, I, I probably shot about maybe a hundred images, and I thought that whenever I got all those hundred images, I was just going to stack all hundred, and it was going to be. But I realized that that comet is moving. That comet is actually moving. And if you try <laughs> to stack a hundred three-minute shots, the head of the comet will turn into an turn into an egg it's blurred you over know, three I mean, minutes yes so i realized that i could only use 10 of those exposures out of the 100 that i had and the 10 that i used had to be in consecutive order so whenever i put all 100 into deep sky stacker and looked at the score what this guy Stacker, it'll give you a scorecard of each image which one's good which one's bad and what you have to do is you have to go in there and look at each all the, each hundred of them and then separate 10 of them out of the hundred that has the highest score along that somewhere along that line of the hundred and once you find 10 that's got the highest numbers or you get a calculator you can add it all up well this one's got this this one's got that this is you now this is the 10 out of that sequence that i want you know so you put the sequence together and that's what that image turned out to be like. I mean, it was just unbelievable. So that's only a sum of 10. That worked out really well. That's pretty good. Yeah. It, it was actually a mistake that I got the settings right that night. I mean, <laughs> and after, after I took that shot, 
I went back and looked at those shots and says, how come this one turned out and all the rest of my images were crap? <laughs> you know what I mean? So I started looking at the histogram, looking at certain, I said, this is why I had it on this setting. I had it on this ISO. And I, I looked at my histogram, all of it was over, shifted over straight in the middle. I didn't have any banding. I said, that's where I need to start using my camera every time I use it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. And then, and then once I nailed down the exposure, the right exposure for this camera to get the best image, then I played around with it up and down up until, until I could fine tune that good spot. You know what I mean? So <laughs> this was the dithering you were talking about earlier, right? We, we... Well, I did not learn about the dithering until later on. I watched a video from Tony Hallis that was trying to explain dithering because at the time I had a lot of noise that was going on in the summertime in the winter or certain times there was just a lot of noise. And I was back then I was using darks and bias and flat frames. And as I began to experiment with these images, I began to realize that the dark frames and the bias frames were taking, were actually taking data out of my image that I didn't want it to take out. But you see what happened? When you're taking a dark frame, the dark frame is not only taking an image of the noise, it's actually taking an image of that color model that's on the CMOS chip. Now, the color model is, uh, if you go outside and it's daylight, and you take an image, you're not going to see that color model. Now, the color model can be described red, green, blue, just a bunch of noise all the way across the CMOS. It's noise versus wavelength, right? It's like how yes. yeah. all the noise in well, the different it's colors. Sort of, it's sort of like an artifact that the bare, the bare matrix on the CMOS sensor creates. It's sort of like an artifact from the image. So uh, when you take that camera, that same camera now, instead of daylight, and you point it at a dark sky at night, that color model gets enhanced, and you bet because you're starting to see it now instead of instead of the bright daylight hiding it from you. You know what I mean? Because that color model is actually part of the image, part of that daylight image that you're taking. That's what creates all the detail, all the colors, and and everything else in there. But where it, it but where it comes into harming an astrophoto is when you take single images, that color model is all over the place. I mean, it's just, it, it's just everywhere. And when you take those dark frames that, that I was just talking about, and you take an image of the noise and the image of that color model, that color model is actually part of the image. That's that a part of the nebula that you're trying to catch. So when that dark frame takes a image of that color model, it will subtract some of that data out of there. And you'll end up losing a lot of your detail in your image actually using those dark frames. So I was looking at a video from Tony Hallis, and I just ran across it one day about how he was using dithering to get rid of his noise. And basically what I found out is if you take a frame and you get a star centered right in the field of view and you keep an eye on it and then you take an image right here and then the second image you move it over just a little bit the next image you move it over up you move it over to the left and then the, th the fourth one you move it down a little bit and what you do is you're creating a pattern a random pattern uh to where that color model it's either it, it's either green uh it's either green red or blue and if you have a blue on top of a blue on top of a blue on top of blue, you're going to be able to see the color model in your images. But if you if you dither the images, you're moving the images all you know all around on this random pattern. You'll have when you go to stack it in Deep Sky Stacker when you line the stars all up, you'll have a blue on top of a green on top of a red, and what happens is you'll cancel you'll cancel that color model out, and it will become a gray, clean background. And that is where you get rid of all your noise. That's where you get rid of all your Well, hang on. I don't think you're getting rid of noise. You're not You're not getting rid of noise. You're canceling out some of the color noise, yes. But the dark current is yeah. still there. You've done nothing with it. The, yeah, so, you see, the dark, current, the dark current is being shifted, too, along with uh, the noise is also being shifted around along with the dithering technique. 
And when you go into deep side stacker, you can put it in camera sigma clipping. And because you put it in camera sigma clipping, okay. it, so it sees that it sees that random that random noise pattern moving around and it wants to it tries to get rid of it. Okay. Because it's not in the same place every single time. Right. I'll get so, okay, so that sigma clipping is important though, because yeah. that's what gets rid of the, the dark current will get go away that way. Yeah. The other I yeah. see so I should point out that this dithering, this moving it around within a frame to take a lot of images of the yeah. same to topic, that is some the color model is a problem specific to CMOS detectors. CCDs don't have this. Exactly. So it's important that yeah. if you did buy a CCD camera, that you this is what he's talking about doesn't matter. But if you've got a DSLR like the T three I or whatever it is, then this becomes an issue at low light levels. And so this is a great technique. Yeah. And for, one thing about a and one thing about this technique, the more images that you shoot, say like if, if you shoot twenty or thirty or forty, the higher in number of the images that you shoot, the more that the noise gets canceled out, out of your image and everything starts smoothing out. That's right. People start asking me, yeah. We've I mean, talked, yeah, we've talked about this. More, always for the better, yes. Yes, yes. It, the, this is why you need those programs like Star Tracker, whatever it was that you, Stacker, whatever it was. When you take a a lot of, a, let's say, 100 one-second images and then you, tie, you, you add them all up, the signal in those images goes up as the number of images that you took, in this case, 100. Exactly. So, the signal-to-noise ratio starts going through the roof. Yes. And your sigma clipping, and your sigma clipping has a better average of what is junk and what is not. That's right. And the, But when you add, yeah. however, the noise does not go up as the number of images. It goes up as the square root of the number of those images. So right, your signal right. goes way up, but your noise only goes up as the square root of that. So you can yeah. cancel, you can reduce your noise quite a bit by taking 100 one-second exposures over one 100 second exposure so yes, that's and yes. so that's an important thing about imaging okay tom but we're running out of time i've only got a couple of minutes but i have to show this picture of the andromeda galaxy holy crap that's beautiful how did you take can, do, do you remember do you know the? I, I'm, I'm showing the i don't know how many you, you sent me of the andromeda galaxy but this one is just stunning um it's you know you can see mm -hmm. the satellite galaxy right next to it m33 and uh, this is M31, the uh, uh, very large object that you can see in it. right about now, actually, is, is one of the best times to view the Andromeda galaxy. Yeah, let me go over here and find it for you, and I'll show you. Okay. My Facebook is kind of frozen here. <laughs> okay, well, while he's doing that, let me just say that the Andromeda galaxy, the easiest way that I have found to see this, to find this object is to look for the constellation of Cassiopeia. In this time of year, it looks like a sideways M or a W. It's sideways. And the top three stars of the W make an arrow that will point toward the constellation Perseus. And halfway in between Perseus and Cassiopeia is this beautiful galaxy. On a really, really yeah, dark night, is, uh, you can I'll see it with your naked you. eye. But you've really got to have extremely dark size and this is huge it's it's larger than a full moon uh if you could see the whole thing but right now we, we can generally only see the nucleus of the andromeda galaxy and remember folks the andromeda galaxy is hurtling straight towards us <laughs> that's right it's coming straight at us um how far away is it peter do you remember is it is it i always forget it's two and a half million light years away is that right or is it going to hit us million Two and a half million. Yeah, two and a half million light years yeah. away. And it's heading towards us. And I think in another yeah. four billion years or so, we're actually going to collide yeah. with it. Oh, that's Unless the great attractor gets us first. The great attractor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm, I'm here now. I took a few minutes here. To, okay. Uh, I've got the image up showing. I, what I have in that image right there is about 220 images stacked. A uh, hundred of those is four minutes each at ISO 400. And if you notice, I did not use any dark frames, no bias frames. I did not even have to use any flat frames because the lenses that I used on this does not produce any bag netting. So I didn't have any, I didn't have to use uh anything to flatten out the field and then the next image 
The next set of images were 120 images at five minutes each at ISO. <laughs> what I did is I stacked all of those together. And basically, this was the camera lens. Oh, hold on. I have to switch shots. Hang on. Go ahead. This is the setup that I used to do it with. It's a dual setup where I'm using two cameras at the same time to get double the image exposure for one night. What kind of lenses are those? These are these are Canon uh, 300 millimeter FD SSC fluorides. These were made back in 1974, believe it or not. Wow, those are beautiful. Yeah. Those are telescopes in their own right, aren't they? Yeah, this thing probably weighs about 20 pounds. This, this whole thing. See, I've got a dovetail plate mounted on the on the bottom of it. Yeah. And it just slips right in. It just slips right into the dovetail plate, and all I got to do is put two two cameras. And I actually had the I actually had had the lenses modified for the FD mount. See. Okay, so that's how you get the cameras attached on there. Great. Yeah, there's a guy. There's a guy that in Canada that makes a uh, that makes a mount that replaces the old FD mount to where you can mount a digital camera to these. Okay. So, uh, All right. Wow, uh, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, that's amazing. All right. Well. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I've got to stop here, and I didn't even yeah. get a chance to talk about this story that you know you you lost some of your equipment and you're able to get it back i wonder tom would you be willing maybe in a in a few maybe a month or so to come back and maybe talk with us again would that be something you might yes be... i'm actually putting a brand new system together everybody i made a post of, uh i actually waited four months before i made the post about my telescope being stolen because the police here told me to keep it out off off of the media to where they can do their investigation and uh about four months rolled around, and about a week or something ago, on a Friday, I finally, I finally woke up one morning and says, "I got to tell everybody because I'm tired of telling everybody excuses about why I'm not imaging right now because I lost my mount, everything, you know, was stolen. Just, you know, I turned my back for a few minutes, and they just drove up with their pickup truck and picked it. Three or four guys picked it up and just took off with it. So uh, I was heartbroken." Wow, I mean, that is terrible. I mean, my life, fifteen thousand dollars was gone within a few minutes. You know, so. But uh, but, uh, but since then, some people have stepped up, and. Uh, oh my God, uh, OPT, uh, you know William Optics, uh, Takahashi America, they all stepped up to the plate, and then I also got Optolon. They make filters. They're sending me a a whole pack of brand new filters, you know, for my new camera. So and everybody just everybody just jumped in, you know, and uh, started. I I didn't. I mean, I feel like the luckiest guy on the planet, you know. That's the, a great story. I love that story. I well, mean, well, it, it says mm -hmm. something about this community that we're in. Astronomy changes a person. It changes how we look at one another, how we see one another. What we're how we're living, all this all this bigotry that we have, all these little useless things that we do to, to, to one another, just disappears when you're when astronomy teaches you who you really are and why we're all here. You know. I couldn't agree more. The amateur astronomy community is one of the kindest yeah. and most yeah. helpful. You're that nobody's out to take advantage of anyone else, and they all yeah. want you to succeed in the hobby. We're it's all really helping fun. one another. And we're all trying to do the best we can. And we're not fighting over our money or the color of our skin. We're all just in, we're all just in it together to learn something, you know, learn something about ourselves. And our place and, in the universe, that's right. And our place in the universe and how lucky we all are to be on this little rock. Well, Tom, before, before I go, and I really do have to, um, tell people how uh, they can follow your work. Where's the best? Should, is it your Facebook page? Uh, is it? I, I got a Facebook page. And I'm actually the founder of the Facebook Astronomy Club. I got I got 44,000 members in mm -hmm. my club from all over the world, all over. I mean, I mean, name a country. I bet I got a hundred members from there. So, or more. Uh, what's the URL for? Is it just Facebook.com/slash what? It's Facebook Astronomy Club. Facebook the, Astronomy Club. The Facebook Astronomy Club. Okay, look that up, folks, and join. And I'm going to go uh, join that as well myself. And that's the best place where people can follow your work, Tom? 
And yes. do you do you yes. do you take there questions I... from people? Yes. And help yes, them out. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's a resource for you folks, and uh, I'm going to have Tom back again. We're going to talk more about imaging and uh, and get some more. But we're going to pick his brain some more with different telescope types and, and tricks and te techniques for getting images taken. Um, I want to thank you so much, Tom, for taking time out for joining us. This has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you guys, and I hope that my message gets out. I want everybody – one of my main goals was to teach everybody how to pull their DSLRs out of their closet and realize they had an imaging rig already there. Well, you have a home here, so anytime you want to join in, you're more than welcome. It's all we're we're here every other Tuesday, so just tell us when you want to join. So, in. yeah, thank yeah. you very much. Okay, so uh, that's it for this this time, folks. Uh, on behalf of my co-hosts uh, John John Suffle and Peter Quinn, I want to thank you all so much for joining us uh, this Thursday. We have Am Carol's back, and we have Astro Coffee uh, Hangout, where we're going to be talking about a paper from astronomers looking at uh, that are publishing they're asking the question is mars warmer with water and was mars actually closer to the sun back in the day so we're going to be talking with people who've published a paper on that and on uh, this thursday next tuesday we're back with the pro edition of Am of telescope talk where I, we have got members uh, of the square kilometer array on hand we're going to learn about what that is and what they hope to do with it uh next week and um so we hope that you'll join us for that thank let us know what you think about these hangouts folks like us, share us, send out the word that these are out here. We want you to get involved in amateur astronomy. We want you to have a good experience. We're here to help you. So on behalf of Tom Pickett and my other two co-hosts, thank you all so much for watching. And as always, keep looking up. Wow, that was great. Yeah.